Hello Shas, welcome to another video where we are going to be taking a look at the next step for the tournament community in the Pariah Nexus mission deck. Now, when we look at this, this is no insignificant thing because the mission deck that we have been playing with Leviathan and what we will move on to in Pariah Nexus, the mission deck has been incredibly important for how we build lists, the things that we have access to and the things that we need to keep control of during a battle in order to make sure that we achieve. For example, uh, during deployment, some of the highest level players will make sure that they have units that are very easily able to get holy within each of the corners that they are able to get close to in order to do investigate signals and be able to get a juicy set of points from there. We also saw a very healthy balance between getting these secondaries done and potentially accepting that one that you draw you cannot get done, but getting a command point as a result of it. With the changes where we now start on zero and build our way up, as opposed to in ninth where you started on 12 or 6 CP after the uh, initial changes that they made. This has meant that your command point economy has been incredibly important. And to GW's credit, this has been a great point of balancing. There have been a number of stratagems that you would want to be able to use, but you can't just spend willy-nilly whenever you want and just make sure that you have these incredible alpha strike turns or make your units completely unkillable and make your opponent unable to inter interact with the game. Now, the first thing that I want to go through is actually for GW. So if the rest of you could just look away for a second and just, just put your fingers in your ears. GW, this isn't deleting Necrons like we agreed on. If you could just get them out because they're a shit faction, anybody who plays them is kind of... Then, you know, that'd be great. We, we agreed, and I would really, really hate for us to have to have a second conversation about this. So, yeah, thanks. All right, everybody else, you can take your fingers out of your ears. Cool, we're done. Uh, all right, so Pariah Nexus, uh, obviously a little bit of a nod to the Warhammer uh, Plus TV show that they've got, as well as some in-game lore events. Uh, what does it mean for everything? Well, the biggest thing is the gambits are gone and that secret missions have taken their place. Now, I've yet to make my mind up on how I feel about these. I'll have to probably play the game and just see how they feel. Uh, it's no longer a win more for a player that's already ahead, which is a really, really good thing. Uh, but it can be if an opponent is just like one point behind, they're eligible to use these secret missions and that could end up swinging things quite heavily. I'm interested to see whether tournaments ban them in the same way that they did gambits and just play the mission deck out. But that will Will come down to balancing in the cards that we've got. The second thing is that there is a big focus from what they've shown on battle line units. Now, it could just be that this is a couple of cards within the deck and everything else doesn't have anything to do with battle line, but at the very least, it means that you will have to consider having battle line in your list because otherwise these will just be completely undoable. And they're not terrible either. Raise Banners just gives you a flat extra 1 VP for each time you're controlling an objective marker. And this happens at the end of each player's turn, so it means you can push a bunch of battle line units out and then start getting stuff by the end of the turns, which is really, really fantastic. Now, it is important to note that you don't get the points technically straight away. You raise the banner at the end of your turn and whatever. We'll have to see how this plays out mechanically. And I'm also curious about, because it says that the player's unit can no longer raise a banner on that objective marker. I assume this means because there's no restrictive wording on there and this game is permissive in nature, not restrictive, uh, that we are able to just have both players have banners up at the same time and so you'll be brawling over that a little bit. It also doesn't stop somebody from taking down your banner, uh, which means that there will be probably a big focus on getting battle line units to just get out there and be able to put banners onto the board and then just start scoring very, very quickly. Now, this does go towards your secondary score, so it means that you can still max out on primary and it will take a little bit of the pressure from this mission rule uh, being off... Uh, you know, having to get every single secondary card done, which means that you can adjust your play style if you've got enough battle line units to facilitate this, to be able to play a very aggressive match and shoot up the board, knowing that you've got all of this stuff to still play the same primary game. But once you've got your banners up, there's no real reason for your battle line unit to hang out on there. Now, this is really good news for things like Eldari and Drakari that are very good battle line units. Uh, our breaches stand out to me. Kroot, when the Kroot attachment are able to take full advantage of this. So I'm really keen to see how this affects the meta. And then we can see that we've got different primary missions. This one is terraforming where you basically perform an action. Yes, actions are back. And we'll see how those interact and how they're worded. Uh, but... From terraforming, it looks like they have done a decent job of 
restricting people so that they can't just get this for free or do some weird janky stuff. Now, obviously, because this is in your shooting phase, it doesn't say the start. Tower players rejoice. We're still going to be able to guide with a unit and then start a terraforming action. Uh, and this will be a little bit of a shakeup, but I feel like we're going to have a very, very similar place to where we were in Leviathan. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a criticism. Leviathan mission deck was incredibly healthy for the game. And as a tournament player and as a big fan of 40k, I'm really glad to see that they have gone down this route and they're keeping this sort of style, but giving us a change up so the game doesn't become stale and tournament play has a chance to evolve. You've then got to change to secondary missions. Like obviously this one I kind of hate, but uh, your opponent picks three units from their army. You have to kill one in order to get five VP. I'm glad that it's not as restrictive as like get one point for one kill, three points for two kills and five points for three kills. I think that would have been a much worse iteration, but at the very least it does show that GW is learning everything from the ninth landscape that we're in, removing a lot of the problematic things there, and then through the Leviathan mission deck being very well thought out and very well balanced, my hope is that they've taken on these lessons and it seems like they have and we're going to have a very, very healthy tournament scene as a result. Now, the other thing as I spoke about with secret missions, you earn 20 VP from completing a secret mission. At the end of the third battle round, you're able to pick a card from your secret mission deck and put it face down and that is something that you're going to achieve and your opponent has to anticipate. Now, uh, the, you can only do this uh, starting with the player who went second, uh, if your VP from the primary mission is less than or equal to your opponent's. So obviously, if you're both even and you're both having a really, really close game, this could provide a lot of variety. This could cause a lot of mind games, honestly. Uh, making people move where you want them to move or react to something that isn't actually happening. My hope is actually that this is well-balanced and a good addition to the game because I think stuff like this is healthy, especially in a tournament perspective where you're wanting to have tournament games come down to the player that made the best decisions or the player that was able to do things like misdirect their opponent by acting like they were staging one way but then making a hard push on another uh, and having a game plan that comes to fruition. Obviously, you don't want to do that because you're deceiving your opponent because this is a game played with perfect information. But this gives just a little bit of something that allows you to get an edge if you play well, think well, and make good decisions based on the card that you choose. Now, the trade-off for it is that you can only score a maximum of 40 primary, where your opponent, if they don't take a secret mission, will be able to score the full 50. So this means that it isn't just a catch-all, I win, and I jump up 20 VP. If your opponent's playing a good game and they're on track to score a 100, this won't actually help you, which is good, but it may, if you're in a, a heavy losing game, but you've got the means to be able to achieve this secondary, not go from a tournament finish of your first game being like, say, 50 points, and instead you end with 70 points. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but across the course of a tournament, that can be the difference between coming, you know, second or third against the other people in a four and one bracket and, you know, knowing that you can't take down the undefeated guy, but being able to push you up into the podium because your battle points have been consistent the whole way through. Now, we see a couple of different things with them. Uh, command insertion is your warlord within range of one or more objective markers in your opponent's deployment zone that you control. That is something you can push towards. Obviously, there is a great amount of risk to that because your opponent will be able to see that happening. Uh, but it is a game plan that you can effectively pull off. And then it shows off a couple of the other secret missions. I'm withholding judgment on this until I actually get a chance to play with it. And for anybody that watches my content, you know that I do this quite a bit. I have a very scientific method in which I approach new things and change. Uh, and if you're having an extreme reaction to any of this sort of stuff, I would recommend that you just hold off. It'll be better for you overall and give yourself a chance to actually see this in practice and then determine whether you like it or you don't. And go in without bias as much as you can. Uh, each prior mission de Nexus mission deck contains 69 cards. And I uh, will include attack and defender decks. I love that from Leviathan. You could pick up a game with an opponent, say, hey, do you have a deck? Do you want to borrow the other half of mine? And you could have physical cards to play with. As an old school poker player, actually having physical cards felt really, really good. And having a, a visual reminder out on the table rather than having to open up the app and go, oh, what am I doing? And this is tabletop battles, obviously. Uh, so I do like that they are sticking to this, also giving six pop-out objective tokens. For people that don't have objective markers, and if you would like to get them, 
go and check the link in the description, panthenstudios.com.au, where you can get customized objective markers. But if you don't have them, then just buying this mission deck means that you are able to play a mission with a friend. It's very approachable and very good for getting people into the game and just taking out one of the barriers to entry into this. Because obviously the more people that start to love our game, the better our tournament circuit will become and the more healthy our game will become with that interest. So that's everything from the Pariah Nexus reveal that we've got. Uh, I am feeling optimistic about this. GW have given me a lot of reason to think that they will do this well. They very, very much seem to be learning from some of the mistakes they've made in the past. And that absolutely makes sense. At the end of the day, this isn't a faceless corporation. This is people that are writing rules for us. So them learning, them listening, them taking on data is all very, very good stuff to give us the most healthy experience possible. And as a TO, I'm very happy for that as well. Uh, hopefully we don't have any wording issues or odd interactions that come up, but if history is anything to go off, we probably will. So we'll deal with that when we get to it. But let me know what you think about Pariah Nexus and what this could all mean. Uh, and whether Necrons should be deleted from the game. Yes, they should. And do the internet things. Like the video, comment, uh, share it to a friend who you think needs to see this. Or don't. I'm not your dad. See you in the next one.